Okay, so once again, uh, I'm not going to do this live because uh, <laughs> the, the connection is being very funny for me uh, in the most peculiar and specific ways. So I'm going to do it like this so that it actually uploads. Once again, setting foundations here. Toward the end of the Vadium period, a great discovery was made, unequaled in the entire history of human civilizations on Earth. People learned the manifest power of collective thought. Here we must define human thought. Man's thought is an energy without equal in, the, in any dimension. It can, it can create beautiful worlds or weapons. It can destroy a planet. And it has created all matter without exception. What we see today, nature, the animal world, man himself, all were created in a great inspiration by divine thought. The many artificial objects, machines, mechanisms we can see today were created by man's thought. You might think that it is the hands of man that produced them, yes. Today, hands have to be used nonetheless. In the beginning, thought creates every detail. Today, man's thought is considered more perfect than in the past because of the indoctrination, uh, what you're led to believe, what you're told to believe until you can potentially start to actually think for yourself a little bit. But that is far from true. In each person of the Vedian civilization, it was a million times faster and fuller of information than the thought of modern man. And you know, num number-wise, a million times, like it, it, it's 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 uh, beyond it. You know, the the number the number thing. Uh, it's it's not about numbers and symbology. Uh, at a certain point, it's about continuity. As proof of this, we can take from the past the knowledge of these plants for healing and food. Nature has a mechanism far more perfect and complex than artificial things. Man did not only call beasts to serve him. He did not only determine the purpose of all the plants. When he understood the power of collective thought, he saw that with its help he could control the weather. He could make a spring flow from the depths. Will, if one mishandles thought, one can strike down a bird in flight and influence the life of a distant star plant gardens on stars or destroy stars. This is not a fiction, but a reality, and this was all given to humanity. Today, each person knows how, having started down that technocratic path, man tried to create a rocket that could fly to the stars. They flew to the moon and back, spending quite a bit of money and energy to the Earth's detriment. But they changed nothing on the moon. A method like this is doomed. It is unpromised and dangerous for all the people of Earth and for other planets. There is another method, much more perfect. By thought alone, one can cultivate a flower on the moon, create an atmosphere capable for man, plant a garden, and be in that garden with one's beloved in the flesh. 
before this, thought must transform the entire earth into a blooming heavenly garden, and this needs to be done by collective thought. Collective thought is powerful. In all the universe, there is no energy capable of inhibiting its actions. Present-day matter and technology are a reflection of collective thought which invented all mechanisms and modern weapons. But remember, I said that in Vedian times, the thought of each living person was immeasurably greater in power and energy. Nine people gathered together could move objects, stones weighing many tons, in order to use collective thought more easily to benefit the majority while simultaneously not wasting time to assemble many people in one place. People thought up of images of different gods. With their help, they began controlling nature. The god of the sun appeared in his image of fire, rain, love, and fertility. People created everything essential to them for life through images in which human thought was concentrated. It accomplished many useful things. For example, rain was essential for watering, so one person aimed his thought at the image of the god of rain. If rain was indeed essential, then many people would direct their energy at the image of rain. When the image had enough energy, clouds would gather and rain would fall, watering the crops. And uh, today, uh, we, we think of, you know, rain dances. Like a single person can do this, it just it takes more time and, and more thought, more energy through the dance, through the uh, ritual, because indeed we are walking rituals. <laughs> Unlimited opportunity was given humanity by divine nature. When humanity was able to overcome the temptations of unlimited power to keep all the universal energies in balance in itself, and gardens, the fruit of human thought, could arise in other galaxies, and man could make other worlds happy. The period known as imagery flourished. Man created in it and felt himself a god in it. Who else could the son of God be? In the imagery period, man acting to God begins to create images. This period lasts 9,000 years. God does not intervene in man's actions, nor has he, it, she, ever, except for subtle guidance, um, appearance, touch, nurturance. The various energies of the universe become excited, tempting man. There are particles of all the universal energies in man. There are many of them, and they are contradictory. But all the particles of the universal energies must be balanced in man, combined into a single harmonious whole, the monad. When even one comes to predominate, the others are immediately reduced. The harmony is violated, and then the earth is transformed and becomes disharmonious. The image can lead people to the beautiful, but it can also lead to destruction, and the unity is violated internally. But what is an image? An image is an energy essence made by human thought. It can be created one person 
or several. A vivid example of collective co-creation of an image is the actors acting. One person describes the image on paper and another depicts the described image on stage. What happens to the actor depicting an invented image? For a time, the actor replaces his own feelings, aspirations, and desires for those inherent in the invented image. In doing so, the actor may change his walk, his facial expression, his usual clothing. Thus, the invented image takes on flesh for a time. Only man has been granted the ability to create images. Man is inhuman here. If you haven't already known, just just so you know, we're, we're not we're not all about the masculine here. This is a a harmonious uh, engagement of all polarities. The image created by man can live in a dimension only as long as a person presents it through his thought. One person or several at once. The larger the number of people nourishing an image with their emotions, the stronger it becomes. Yep. <laughs> an image created by collective human thought can possess tremendous destructive or constructive power. It has a feedback connection with people and shapes the character and the manner of conduct of large and small groups of people. Maybe some of you may be thinking about uh, religion or uh, certain forms of egregors, which ties back into religion. Uh, Heroes. Using the discovery of their great possibilities, people enthusiastically created the planet's life as it happened. However, at the beginning of the imagery period, only six people were unable to keep in balance within themselves the universal energies God had given man at creation. They may even have appeared so that humanity could experience everything. At first, only in one of the six did the energy of greatness and selfhood take the upper hand, then in another, a third, and a sixth. At first, they did not meet each other, they did not meet together, each lived by himself, but like was drawn to like. Now they directed their thought to how to become rulers of all the people of the earth. Publicly, they called themselves priests. I'll continue that another time.